Let me give the floor for the final session to our two speakers. Last year, again, at the end of Global, Go Global Procurement Conference number one, we said, well, in the world of multilateral development bank, there's a new elephant in the room, and this elephant in the room, we don't have it here. And so we brought the elephant, with all due respect, here, uh, and uh, obviously that elephant is the new Asian Infrastructure Development Bank. There are very high expectations about its role for development in the 21st century. We were so eager to know more. We wanted also to know how it would start interacting with other important partners, among which obviously a great friend of uh, the program, which is African Development Bank, which has always been close to the EBRD in seeing the importance of capacity building in procurement. And so this explains why we have these two fantastic speakers with us today. Hamid Sharif, Director General of Compliance, Effectiveness and Integrity Unit at the Asian Infrastructure Bank, a friend whom I had the pleasure to meet many years ago when he was at the Asian Development Bank. Uh, I'm, I'm going to cut short on the CVs because I want them to speak a long time. And Ashraf Ayad, now Chief Procurement Officer at the African Development Bank Group, we also with many, many, well, I would say many years, not many decades, but many years of experience in procurement and project management, uh, especially in Africa and the Middle East. So I leave them the floor, as, um, thanking them again for accepting to be here with us today. I don't know who has decided that you should start first. I mean, uh, iniziamo, you know which one is your, you have slides? I do have slides. Iniziamo da lui. Well, as they're finding these slides, let me just kick off by saying uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, coming all the way from Beijing and spending three, four days is an expensive business, but uh, I'm really glad I came. I think the two conferences have been absolutely first rate, um, and uh, I've been very, very impressed. And I've also got um, a couple of takeaways um, from, these, from these two days. One is, on a, on a lighthearted note, which I take very seriously is that the, uh, as the uh, chief economist Valetti said, I think uh, one or two days ago, that the opportunity cost of doing work in Rome is very high. I, I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, so I think you know, we should take that away and uh, um, somehow uh, make sure that our organizations reduce the, uh, that opportunity cost so we can, we can work harder. Um, secondly, let me say that you know, and I, I, and I start from the point which um, I, I, uh, I was responding to, to Christopher's question. That is very clear. I, I joined multi, uh, Asian Development Bank in 1993. The procurement office at that time was a dumping ground. No one took procurement seriously. You know, it's all the guys who, who were no good for operations or you couldn't fire them and you had to do something with them. You put them into procurement. And it was a very sleepy sort of an office. And I think that's probably true for a lot of other MDBs too. But that began to change. And today, when you talk about procurement, uh, it's the, the emphasis is totally different. It's taken much more seriously. There's a much higher degree of professionalization, uh, I think, in the world generally and, and in MDBs. And then, of course, people have woken up, and, and, and I have to thank Gustavo, because when we worked together in the lead up to the Busan uh, conference, one of the small publications uh, which Gustavo helped us was to really demonstrate the importance of procurement for developing countries. That if you think 40% of GDP is high for uh, Netherlands. I think we estimated that for India, if you took into account central government, provincial governments, SOEs, you're talking about 70 to 80 percent. And same for Vietnam, same for China, because you have SOEs involved. So procurement is absolutely huge. And because it is huge, and it has this tremendous potential to influence, I think we're now getting many different perspectives which we've heard in the last couple of days. Gender, green procurement, human rights, etc. 
So to what extent can, 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 um, can this be a vehicle for this? But let me first kick off with the AIIB. We're the new kid on the block. Um, I joined the AD, AIB about one year ago. The bank was established 18 months ago. Um, let's just see if we can get this to work. Does it work? No, how, how does it go? Yeah. Ah, it does. Okay. Let me just, uh, I think it's important to understand why this bank was formed. Um, let me keep in, if you look at, an, I'm not going to bore you with all, this, all these slides, but, but the basic story is this, that, you know, if you, first of all, Asia itself is so uneven. If you look at the definition of Asia, you have small Pacific islands to Afghanistan to China, which is still a developing country. And, you know, the contrast is absolutely huge. And the needs for infrastructure is, is critical. Uh, if you look at the countries which have developed successfully, they historically spent a large part of their GDP on infrastructure development. So if you don't invest in infrastructure, you're not going to go up the economic ladder. And this is, this is now so well established that um, if you look at Korea, Japan, and now China, I was country director in China for five years, and uh, the Chinese have a fantastic saying, and you go to any village, and they will tell you this, that if you want to get rich, Build a road, build a bridge. And I visited villages in China where, for example, you know, if you went back 10, 15 years ago, you had farmers growing peaches, lovely peaches, and a lot of them would just perish and they would just enjoy them for a few weeks. Now, thanks to the road and thanks to the IT infrastructure, which is incredible in China, by the way, I mean, I carry this around, I don't need a wallet. When I go to buy my coffee, I pay through this. I can buy my lunch through this. I can shop through this. And I can do it all online. Um, just to give you, an, give you a, an interesting tidbit, it is estimated um, that 20% of all traffic in Beijing at any given time is related to e-commerce. Vehicles transporting stuff on the roads and it's adding to the congestion. It's that high. So come back to the, the villager. So the villager who now grows peaches, not can he just transport them by road, which is what we're doing, but in the last few years, they've gone one up. You can contact this farmer and say, I want this tree to be reserved for me, and I want you to send me the picture every month, every week, so I can see how my peaches are, are, are growing. And there's a friend of mine who runs an NGO, Chinese friend, who's, who's helping farmers to do something like this. So, you know, we're seeing tremendous... So, so infrastructure development is so important if countries are going to lift people out of, out of poverty. And China, I think, is a primary example of that, where China has lifted four to 500 million people out of poverty because of those tremendous investments. Um, Population growth is, 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 is growing. You've got urbanization happening all across um, Asia. If you don't invest, you're going to get uh, slums. You're going to get awful cities. But if you do invest, then you have a tremendous uh, chance to, to give world-class services to, to ordinary people. You combine that with the challenges which we all know about climate change. Um, it puts a lot of uh, uh, demand for infrastructure. Estimates of infrastructure, uh, the latest ones, which uh, ADB and ADBI came up with, you need about 1.3 trillion per year. That's a lot of money. And if you look at what World Bank, ADB, EIB does a tiny little bit in, in Asia, and EBRD does a tiny little bit in Mongolia, um, all of that doesn't even come to 50, 60 billion dollars. And the demand is something like $1.3 trillion. So it was a no-brainer that, that you, you need um, a new bank. And that's the background against which AIB was established. When it was established, because it, the idea came from China, there was a lot of suspicion. People thought, oh my God, you know, this bank is going to come, it's going to lower standards. What's it going to do? Um, and so... We went through that phase. I think 
Now, after 18 months of operation, people are beginning to, beginning to understand that this is a bank which is uh, very much um, like other, uh, it's, it's part of the multilateral development bank family. Um, it took off quite quickly the idea. I remember in October 2013 when President Xi announced the idea, within a year you had 22 countries which had signed on to the memorandum. Um, you went very quickly through um, uh, meetings of chief negotiators. At some point, the European uh, countries, especially the UK, Luxembourg and Germany, decided to uh, join the bank against the advice from one of their strong allies, uh, as did Korea and Australia. And then the momentum just began. And very quickly, you had 57 founding members. Uh, that number in the last one month has gone up to 80. Um, out of G7 uh, countries, five are members. Uh, US and Japan are not. But Japan, if, you've been, if you follow Japan, the Nikkei uh, wrote an editorial just about 10 days ago urging the Japanese government to join the AIIB. Um, so we expect that by the end of the year, the number of countries uh, which, are, which are members uh, of the bank uh, will, in fact, increase. Um, the bank has got to, off to a, well, let me talk about the governance structure of the bank. It's, it's quite similar in many respects to what you see in existing MDBs. You have the board of governors, you have the board of directors, the president, the vice presidents, but there are some key differences. One is, this bank opted not to have a full-time resident board. Uh, it was felt by many who had been part of those structures that these don't, don't make sense. They're terribly expensive. They're inefficient. Uh, the board should be really setting policy and not interfering in day-to-day -day, um, work of the bank. Um, Many of us who've been there, in, you know, and Jack, Jack I, I feel for him, and my, as a head of procurement, um, my biggest headache was from board members chasing up basically narrow mercantilist interests of their firms, which, from, from, from their countries. Uh, which is, is, that, is that what you pay board members for? Um, so, you know, a lot of, lot of debate on this, but ultimately the majority said, no, we will not have a full-time board because it's expensive and it's inefficient. So we opted for a, a non-resident board, which meets every quarter, and in between they can have um, virtual meetings. In fact, there was one virtual meeting yesterday, uh, for, and, and a project uh, was approved for, for India. But as part of that bargain, the board said, well, okay, if we're not going to be a resident board, then we want to have some mechanism to assure us about oversight. So they actually provided in the articles of agreement that they would, that the board would establish an oversight mechanism. That oversight mechanism is the unit which I had, which is called the compliance, effectiveness, and integrity unit. Uh, and I report directly to the board. It's a very, very unusual uh, governance arrangement. Um, it's a very bold experiment, and it got bolder on the day I joined, after I'd been selected. Um, President Jin uh, said to me, we had worked together at the Asian Development Bank. He was vice president, and I was assistant general counsel. He said, look, I haven't brought you here for you to be fixing problems after they've occurred. I want you to help me to prevent problems from occurring. So he said, even though it's not in the mandate, we never discussed this with the board, but I'm going to allow you in into management meetings and the executive committee meetings. And we then discussed whether I should be part of the investment committee, and, and I said, no, I don't, that gets me too close because I'm supposed to be inspecting them, investigating complaints. But by bringing me in as observer into the management committee, I think it's, it's something quite unique in the MDB world. My counterparts, which are the heads of evaluation, heads of um, complaints mechanisms, or heads of, in, of integrity, anti-corruption, um, they're pretty independent 
but they're pretty aloof. No one talks to them. No one wants to talk, talk to them. They, they kind of said, okay, you're independent. Good luck. Um, and in, um, in my case, it's quite different because I sit right in the bank. Uh, it gives a very unique opportunity to actually comment on what's going on in the bank. And because I don't report to any of the people I'm sitting with, I report to the board, I can say what I like. And I think that, 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 that is very different from the practice of, of other MDBs. The, there was another one? Okay. Um, one interesting uh, feature of the bank is it has a very high uh, paid up capital, 20%. Um, Over five years, 20% of our paid up capital, of our paid up cap capital will be in. So 20% of the authorized capital will be paid in. Now, to give you the magnitude of this, ADB and World Bank are below 5%, right? So this is a bank which will have a, has a lot of liquidity. Uh, we actually don't need to go to the market, but we will, because we need to send benchmarks so that we can do other um, financial products. We need, to set, we need to have a benchmark. So we're in the process of getting our ratings. Um, Moody's granted us the highest AAA rating. We're waiting for Fitch and S&P and we expect those to be quite favorable, and when that is done, we do expect to go, go to the market later in this year. The other feature of the bank is that we don't, we're not aiming to be broad-based policy banks trying to do everything. Um, we want to be very focused. We are an infrastructure bank, and we say infrastructure and other productive sectors. So that may later on is open to interpretation what that will mean, but presumably we could do industry and, and so on. Because if, if we, don't, we don't build infrastructure for the sake of it. You build infrastructure because you're going to put a lot of other productive uh, 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 factors around it so that you, know, you, can, you can get economic growth. The abiding um, values of the bank are to be lean, which is not to mean that we're cheap or, we, or that we cut corners, but it means we're efficient we try to be smart about how we do things. And one part of this is we are not going mad about hiring people. Um, to give an example, I think the, I'm told that the EBRD went from zero to 300, maybe even 3,000, I forget which figure, but in about three months. Well, 18 months on, we're about 110. And I, in my, my department, I had no one as a staff until February this year. So we are really pra practicing uh, to be lean because we think that, you know, we should not fill in a position until we're able to justify that position 100% of the time. In the meantime, we, we make do with consultant resources. And also, we're so terrified of hiring the wrong people and getting stuck with them, as in, as in other, other banks. These are the lessons we're learning from, from other banks. Clean, uh, absolutely no tolerance for corruption. So one of the first policies passed by the bank was actually an anti-corruption policy, um, which is on par with the other MDBs. In fact, I, I, when I met uh, Leonard McCarthy, the outgoing vice president of integrity at the World Bank about a month back, he complimented um, AIB on its policy and said in many ways it was ahead of the World Bank's, and if they had to do it, he would take many features which we have. Um, we've voluntarily said that we will abide by the uh, cross department which other uh, five major banks have, even though we're not party to that cross department agreement, but we voluntarily have, have agreed to recognize that risk because we, as the newcomer, we did not want to produce this integrity arbitrage. So com the companies which cannot do business, say, with EBRD or World Bank, they can suddenly start doing business with us. That would send a very wrong signal. It has upset some people, I can tell you. I've had representation from some firms saying, oh, we thought you were going to be different and we will do business with you. And, and we said, no, this, this is a policy issue and uh, we will be, um, we, we align ourselves with the anti-corruption efforts of other banks. We're a clean bank, so lean, clean, green. The green part, we're still in the process of defining, but the objective is that as far as possible we will incorporate green values and so green procurement is very important for us. 
we have not articulated how we how we are going going to do it because it's not a procurement issue as i keep on saying it's a design issue it's a philosophy issue that unless the people who designed these projects actually put that as part of the project definition then you know the procurement people can't really do much about that i don't think you know it's the it's the tail wagging the dog if you leave it to the procurement people um we complement other MD, uh, MDBs in several critical areas. We bring more money to the table. We're now beginning to see uh, AIB do a lot of co-financing with other MDBs, and therefore we can do bigger projects. Uh, like them, we are aspiring for very high environmental and social requirements. We, I think because of our membership, we strengthen the voice of the developing countries um, by our charter, 70% of all members have to be regional of course that means some developed countries like australia and korea and japan too but the majority are in fact developing countries and we want to be innovative with with our lean model and going forward we want to be able to uh, differentiate ourselves in 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 different ways um we as i said we we don't uh, we're not aspiring to be a broad based policy bank so we don't have uh, budget uh, we don't have program lending or um, structural adjustment type of lending. We don't do concessionary finance. Um, we, unlike the World Bank and like the ADB, we actually do public and private sectors under the same roof. So we have one balance sheet so we can uh, work with the private sector. Um, three key uh, thematic areas which we've identified is A, we will support sustainable infrastructure, particularly most of our money we'll end up going to, in the initial phases, to energy and transport, which is not surprising because the, that's where the bulk of the money is. We will be very big on supporting connectivity across Asia. I should say that doesn't mean that we are a one belt, one road institution, which is what a lot of people think we are. We're not. We've done lots of projects which have nothing to do with one belt, one road, but we will, if, if our borrowers prioritize any of those projects in the belt and road, we certainly will finance them, just like ADB and World Bank will. So we're not, we're, not a, we're not a belt and road institution. We want to pay a lot of attention to, to mobilizing private capital for infrastructure. And I come back to this 1.3 trillion figure. There is no way that the governments and the multilateral development banks can finance 1.3 trillion every year. There, this has to come from the private sector. So we want to work with others to innovate financial products uh, to bring that uh, investment from the private sector in. Let me just skip that. Um, so we do you know, sovereign loans, we do non-sovereign loans, equities, credits, guarantees, etc. We've uh, done actually more than 2.5 billion now within 18 months, which is very fast when you look at the other banks. Uh, it took, I think, well, ADB was very long time ago, but ADB did not have a loan until about two years from its, from its creation. So we've moved very fast because we're lucky. We were, we were born at a time when there's a lot of MDB experience out there, so we could leverage off that. We have partnerships with the MDBs, and that has helped us. Um, I'm gonna, okay, let me come to procurement. Um, we are part of the MDB family. Uh, I think the MDBs have done a tremendous job over the last several decades in establishing certain principles, and we certainly do not wish to derogate from those. We want to build on those, if anything. And a few things which our articles provide, which is like others, that one is, you know, we're driven by economy and efficiency. Uh, but unlike some of the other regional banks, we've gone for universal eligibility. So even though Japan and U.S., for example, are not members, we certainly have no problem if they are the most competitive uh, bidders. We will certainly finance those contracts. We also practice, I should mention, universal recruitment as well. So even if your country is not a member, you can still apply for jobs in AIB. And we have several... Uh, staff who are not uh, from member countries, but you know, we, we have hired them. Um, we align with other uh, MDBs and international agreements, so WTO, GPA, UNCITRAL, European Directives, Sound Commercial Practices, and so on. Um, 
we want to meet the expectations of our borrowers and suppliers who I think expect that as a responsible MDB we will, we will stick to the accepted uh, principles of procurement uh, to be fair, to have open bidding and so on. Um, so we have some core principles uh, of procurement which are in our guidelines which are not surprising to any of you, economy, efficiency, effectiveness, fairness, good governance, value for money, fit for purpose, transparency. Uh, we can talk about them you know, if you have any questions. As I said, we, because we had an anti-corruption policy, we've uh, aligned with the others, but in some ways we've gone ahead of the World Bank and others, uh, including ADB. We have, we have a couple of more prohibited practices, but I think we're fully aligned with the EBRD. So we have theft and misuse of resources, which the others don't have. Um, we are, uh, we have, we, because we, we, are, we can do private sector uh, projects, so we, we have provisions on private sector procurement. Uh, generally, we trust the private sector to be efficient, but if they're getting a concession, then we need to see a process through which that concession has been granted fairly. Um, we deliver, we discuss with the, uh, as part of project design, we want a procurement plan and we want a plan on how to deliver that, that procurement. And this is something which my office is going to keep an eye on. Um, and I think one of the things you might have heard me say on the first day is that I think one of the things MDBs and in fact other procurement agencies at the national level are not very good at is keeping an eye on project implementation. So why are projects not signed on time? Why are payments delayed? And I think if we just track these two things this will be good enough to, to really increase um, efficiency. Uh, again, this is very standard uh, that you, know, you have a procurement plan. Um, I, I'm not going to bore you with that at all. Let me, this, this is all pretty standard stuff, but I want to just take a bit of time to come back to uh, some of the larger well, let me talk about use of country systems because, you know, we can use country systems and we just use them in a project in Oman where when we went in, a lot of the engineering and procurement had been done and we had to go in and check that. Now, it wasn't perfect, but it was largely there. So a lot of judgment calls had to be made. Uh, we applied the MAPS uh, uh, methodology to satisfy ourselves that the country system actually was acceptable. Where it wasn't, we put in conditions. For example, they didn't have very good dispute resolution. So we've said for our project, you will have a dispute resolution mechanism. So that's going to be done. But I think in this way, we, you know, the Oman government has been excellent. So they, they looked at these, they take, took note of them. And I think there's a very strong possibility that we may actually contribute to strengthening their country systems because they may take the gaps which we've identified and they may take steps to actually fix them which I think would be a huge gain for development uh, if this is the way we could, we could go forward. But at the end of the day, like, like all procurement, it's about judgment. Now, when you use country system, it's going to be about, about judgment. There's, it's not going to be perfect. And we, again, we know, we learn from the World Bank experience. Uh, Jack and I, when we were in the heads of procurement, we, 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 we saw this very tortuous attempt by the World Bank to have equivalence of uh, country systems with its own policies. And the methodology was so rigorous that no con country on earth, including the OECD countries, could actually qualify. So, you know, it, it, a country system is something I think um, we're, comfortable, we're comfortable with, but it doesn't mean we're going to lower standards. Hopefully it's a, it's a, it's a process through which by identifying the gaps, we will help countries to actually improve. I want to take the last five minutes to talk about uh, some of the bigger issues on, on, on procurement, uh, especially with respect to MDBs. When I joined in the 90s, uh, I was in the legal department, and it was an absolute pain if you had to review procurement documents, because every procurement document was different. At that time, MDBs didn't have standardized documents. So you had bidders sending all sorts of thing, things to you. And you had to read this thick document from A to Z to figure out you know, whether you could accept them. Then I think one of the 
best things which happened, with the, especially through the heads of procurement, was uh, especially after Paris, a massive effort to harmonize. Because the developing countries, and many of you are from those procurement agencies, guys, guys, you know, we can't deal with it. World Bank comes and says, do this. ADB comes and says, do that. EBRD comes and has a, yet some other requirement. Why can't you guys get your act together and make our lives simple? So there was a tremendous effort at harmonization, which I think largely succeeded. But since I left the HOP in 2012, there have been revolutionary developments. The old procurement guidelines, which I was very comfortable with, no longer exist in these banks. So you now have this principle-based approach, you have these rules, you have documents. I don't know where harmonization is now. I mean, are we still using those harmonized documents? Certainly, reading the policies, it would seem there's no compulsion to. So that, I think, raises a lot of challenges and high transaction costs, both for the MDBs and for the borrowing countries. And I think that's something I hope the HOPs, and I'm not there, but Jack is and others, I hope you know that's something the HOPs can take up because it would be so sad if in the name of reform, we've inadvertently actually things made worse by moving to this principle-based based approach. So the cost to clients, I think, is something we should worry about. Worry about. We've also moved to a risk-based uh, approaches, which I think is essentially good, but it also means that we need, our risk appetite needs to go, go up, that, that you know, the reputation risk is, is higher because we're trusting local authorities a lot more than we were before. And I'm still waiting for the first terrible case to come up and then see how the boards of these MDBs react. Uh, because we all love these, you know, risk-based approaches, but, you know, when the proverbial stuff hits the roof, uh, that's, when, that's when people start panicking and saying, oh, my God. And I think it comes back to a, a point which uh, was made about corruption uh, yesterday or the day before, that, you know, we all say zero tolerance. Oh, is, is it is it zero tolerance? And I'll come back to that red map which Jack put up. I mean, you can't realistically be zero tolerance if you're operating in some of these countries. So you're necessarily agreeing to take some risk, a lot of risk, in fact. So it's very fashionable and politically correct to say zero tolerance. But, uh, you know, we need to, we may perhaps need to be more, more realistic about the uh, countries and the agencies with which we work. And, and just accept that you know, there's going to be uh, 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 some level of risk. Um, and very finally, and I mean, you can take this up in the, in the, in the, in the questions, um, Christopher, in the previous session, made the point, and which is a good one, that, well, you know, if you're going to have all these wonderful things about human rights and gender and so on in your procurement contracts, then, you know, you're actually creating benefits for a third party which can't enforce the contract. Absolutely right. But MDBs have actually solved that problem. Uh, we have a much larger contract, which is called our financing agreement. In our financing agreement, we actually put quite onerous stipulations with respect to environment and social safeguards. The beneficiaries of those are not the MDBs. The beneficiaries of those are people affected by our projects. And when we fail to enforce the contract with the borrowers, we have a complaints mechanism to which people can come. And I think that might be the model for the national authorities, that by way of administrative law type of remedies, like an ombudsman or some other authority, people who stand to benefit should be able to go to those mechanisms and trigger enforcement. I'll stop here. I'm happy to discuss later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amid. We know much, definitely much more than I'm sure everybody knew when we entered this room, and that is actually extremely important. And I look forward to questions. Uh, Ashraf, do you have a presentation? Well, thank you. 
Good afternoon, first of all, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Gustavo. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very pleased uh, that we've been invited as the African Development Bank to be in this uh, uh, wonderful event. I have been um, listening since this morning uh, to really, really very good discussions, very informative, you know, very distinguished speakers made me uh, regret really that I did not come two days earlier and attended the past two days as well. Uh, mentioning uh, distinguished speakers, Maybe I should say I'm not really sure what I'm doing here, but uh, I will try to give you some information. I'm also very happy to see the, uh, the students, which I've met last month in, in Rome also. It's really always a pleasure to, to see them. Um, the only difference I'm seeing that they uh, have lost weight and that they uh, look very tired and they're not smiling, and I'm not really sure what happened over this month. What, have they done to you? I am not really uh, uh, quite sure. But at least you've made it to this stage, and uh, you are very close now to your uh, closing ceremony. And I think the only thing that is standing between you and the closing ceremony is my presentation. And that's why I'm going to make it, you know, about maybe one and a half, two hours. It's not going to be long, but I will do my best. Um, let me see first if this works. Yeah. My presentation, basically, I mean, listening to all what has been uh, mentioned today and to build up on what Hamid has said, uh, to bring you a little bit more into the MDB's world and to, uh, uh, to inform you how we do procurement from our perspective, from our point of view. So, uh, but I'm not going to discuss all procurement. I'll just introduce the bank very quickly in a very few slides and mention a couple of slides on our new procurement framework. But my focus is really in, in, in this presentation is to um, make you or to inform you about or explain our philosophy and our approach to the use of country systems. I know Amit also has touched on that. In, in his presentation and give you an example of that. So it's only four, it's not uh, four items, and like 30 minutes each, no problem. So it's not going to be long. The ADB group, as other MDBs, uh, includes three entities below it. Very quickly, the African Development Bank, which is our non-concessional window. So countries in Africa that are not um, that we call middle-income countries like Tunisia, Egypt, Morocco, South Africa, those countries cannot borrow except from that window, from that entity, uh, as the loans there are very close to market rates. We also have the African Development Fund, which is our concessional window, so other countries that are still developing or that are called developing countries can only borrow from the African Development Fund. We also have the Nigeria Trust Fund, which is a fund that is funded only from Nigeria and it's concessional as well. The bank was founded in 1964. All African countries are members of the bank. We also have 27 what we call non-regional member countries, which are countries from all over the world that are also interested in development in Africa. The bank's capital is around 100 billion uh, US dollars as it stands today. This is just some quick information. Our projects, as you see them on the screen, um, and maybe as Hamid was saying also, most of our financing or 45% of our portfolio would go into infrastructure. Agriculture is about 12%, uh, though I think that in the coming years, agriculture seems to be enjoying a lot more emphasis. I'm not very sure, maybe because our president has an agriculture background, maybe, but anyhow, but it's, uh, so we expect this percentage to, to increase. Uh, industry and mining is only 4%. Finance, 13%, and so on. This map, if you, what, what you see here, is the projects where the bank is involved in in Africa at the moment. And they are color-coded by our five, what we call the high fives, which are the main or the highest objectives that the bank has included in its recent strategy, which is light up and power Africa, feed Africa, industrialize Africa, integrate Africa, and improve the life of people in Africa. Um, our total cumulative approval since the bank started is about 131 billion uh, US dollars. Just to give you the flavor of the size of our operations, 
Like in 2016, uh, we have financed contracts. These are not projects, contracts that about 2,500 contracts. And it's in the range of between two and two and a half billion US dollars. This is not the total bank portfolio. This excludes the private sector lending and excludes the budget support and program lending and so on. So this is really, um, uh, the figure is, is higher than that. Um, if we look at this division of these contracts in terms of goods, works, and services, uh, by value, works, of course, is the highest. If you look at 2016, $1.8 billion went into works, uh, $287 million went into services, and $261 million went into uh, goods. By number, again, of course, works is higher, about uh, 1,000 contracts uh, into works, 921 contracts, into services and 595 contract into goods. These information is really just to give you the feel of uh, what the African Development Bank is all about, its operations, uh, how many contracts, what is the size of the portfolio, and so on. However, I want to really specifically to, to speak about the bank's procurement framework. In 2013, end of 2013, we did a complete reform of our procurement policy. Previously, we had the procurement rules and procedures. There were two documents, and uh, one was for procurement of goods, one for procurement of uh, services. And, uh, however, it was the first time in the bank's history to relook its procurement policy from the beginning till the end and to make a complete overall of, of the procurement policy. And what we came up with is what we call now the procurement framework. Our procurement framework includes a policy document, which is principles-based, it's around 30 pages. Uh, it just captures the main principles uh, that the bank would like to respect and follow while doing procurement. And then there is a complementing com um, document, which is called the methodology. It explains in detail how the procurement policy can be implemented. Uh, a larger document is the operations procurement manual, and we have also the procurement toolkit. What we've introduced there during the reform is that the two documents, top two documents, were approved by the board, and the other two documents are approved by management. Why did we do this? Because we wanted to separate policy matters from procedure issues. Procedure issues, when we do financing of projects, we come across situations where we are required to uh, introduce a deviation into our documents or something from our rules that is still acceptable to us. And if we have to get the approval of the bank's board on that, it means it's very time-consuming process. So we want to give management more room and more flexibility to approve uh, these type or to take these type of decisions. Um, like other banks, we uh, put value for money as the ultimate objective. Optimal value for money is the ultimate objective where our, we would like our member countries or regional member countries to achieve. We base this on four procurement principles, the four E's, which we call the economy, efficiency, effectiveness, and equity, not equality, equity. And while doing this, we want to be using processes and procedures that are competitive, fair, and transparent. So our procurement framework basically is principle-based. It relies in substantial part on the professionalism and maturity of the implementing actors, and I'm going to explain this. How is that when we talk about our approach to the use of country system? It did not by any means dilute the fiduciary standards of the bank. It adopts a risk-based engagement to achieve value for money. Again, I'm going to explain this uh, just now. And what I'm going to discuss is that it considers the full use of borrower procurement systems or country procurement systems and I underline many times the word full. So the main part of my presentation, what is exactly our philosophy and our approach when we talk about country systems? What we used to do before is maybe um, we used to go to any particular country we used to do a quick assessment of the country systems. As Hamid was mentioning in, you know, before 2012, uh, maybe following what the World Bank was doing, emphasizing equivalence, no country ever, and specifically we are talking about Africa, will be found with a system that would meet the banks, talking African Development Bank expectations or standards with. 
What does this mean? It means that we will not be able to accept for our projects the use of any country system anywhere. So the practice at the time was that, okay, we are going to um, use the system. However, we are going to include some caveats, conditions that we put in agreement with the country saying, okay, you can use the system, but you cannot use apply one, two, three, four, five on our, while implementing our project. Now, when, when, when thinking of this new framework, we, we thought of this and said, what actually are we doing? What we are doing was a system that includes a lot of these caveats and conditions of provisions that cannot be applied is not really the country system. It's not the bank system either. In fact, what we ended up creating is we are using some system somewhere that it can be a blend between the country and the bank maybe, but it's a third system where jurisprudence does not exist. No one has experience in implementing it in any way. And so we said, no, maybe this is not the best way we should, be, we should be doing that. What if we decided to use the country systems in full? In other words, we use the country system as we found it. Not, of course, for all transactions, but for transactions where we identify that the risk for the bank by doing so is acceptable or can be tolerated meaning we use the institutions in the country, we use the legal, uh, the framework in the country, we use the, uh, um, uh, the mechanisms for complaints, redressal mechanisms, everything. Why do we want to do it this way? Because we wanted to be a true partner. We wanted to, be, to have more leverage when we discuss with countries about the reforms to their system. If we are putting the bank's money into the country systems as they are, it gives us more leverage, becomes a shareholder in, this, uh, in those systems and gives us more leverage to decide to discuss with the country. First, to identify what the real issues are, where their shortfalls are, and then to encourage countries to do these reforms. And I'm, as I'm saying that, we, well, we called it, we put our foot in the door, that's why it's here, we called it building by using incentive, which is an incentive modulated uh, mechanism. Okay, so by doing so, we felt that we will be avoiding the creation of alternative systems, but if the country is using its systems in full for some contracts, it means that we cannot, while doing our oversight, do prior review of those contracts because we cannot be really uh, doing the interpretation of somebody else's law. So in that sense, the country interpretation also will be used for those contracts to be done by using the country system. The relation will be driven by the financing agreement. I'm going to explain how in a moment. We will even rely on the fraud and corruption mechanisms and institutions in the countries after assessing them as well. And in a case, for example, for debarment, what if we, are, you know, we leave it completely for the country and then they end up awarding a contract to a firm that is debarred by the bank, for example, then in this case we said we are not going to finance this contract. I'm sure all what's on your mind now is that this is extremely risky. What exactly are you talking about? I hope I know. Risk involved. If we look at our portfolio in the bank, we found if we draw a graph between the cumulative number of contracts and the cumulative distribution of work contracts and between value and number, we will find that this is how it looks like. What does it mean? It means that for 82% by number of the contracts that the bank finances, they only represent 10% by value. In other words, that the majority of the contracts that we are consuming our time and effort and resources in represents only 10% of our portfolio. The larger amount of contracts are all high-value contracts, and they only 10% in number, but they represent 90% in value. Goods, no difference, 80% by number, 10% by value. Services, a little bit smaller, 65% by number, 10% by value. So we said, okay, let's look at these 
65% or 80% by number of our contracts and see which of those we can use the country system um, in full. But before that, the advantages that we saw into doing this, and one important advantage is that the rationalization of resources that the bank is using. On the right, those two pie charts represent the work by a procurement specialist in the bank. The top one, you will find that as per the previous rules and procedures, we're spending most of our time on compliance, compliance issues, quantitative issues, and so on, and we don't really have time to engage the countries into strategical, meaningful dialogue and reforming their system. And we are a development bank at the end of the day, and we have a development mandate to develop those systems in the countries. What we expect this to be reversed, if we are putting most of the contracts, or the contracts at least a large number of them, small value contracts to be done completely by the country systems, then in fact we are going to use most of our time discussing with countries in a systemic advisory and qualitative manner on how to do realistic reforms. So this, this is the, uh, the idea. So it avoid, not only avoid creation of alternative systems, but provide the bank with more legitimacy to work with RMCs, better utilization of resources, better ownership of procurement, saving time in the absence of the second check. Yeah, well, maybe I explain this. The way the countries do in Africa, Nevertheless, that we say the bank's rules are going to apply, and this is even mentioned in the financing agreement in everything. Then what we found is that because at the end of the day it's implemented by civil servants in the government, they would opt still to follow the government rules, and they have to go to the government tender board, they have to get this approval, that approval, even though before seeking no objection from the bank. And we found that this is consuming a lot of time. However, if we're using only the country systems, then in this case, this time of going back and forth with the bank will also be saved. So this is one of the advantages that we see. What does this exactly also require on our side? That the skills retooling is required in the bank and even at the level of the borrowers. Now, because we are talking about bank procurement specialists playing a more strategic role rather than being really transaction oriented. How it happens in practice, for any project we will do a country level assessment that is only diagnostic. It is not, is decision free. We do not make any decisions when we do a country level assessment, yes, it's based on maps, maybe now the revised maps is going to be to come out and we are going, we are part of, of the committee that is working on that. But it only says where are the issues are and what is the impact of those issues in terms of how it can affect different type of transactions under our projects. We do at the sector level, we do sector capacity assessment, we do a market analysis, which we did not used to do much before to know the context, and we also do an assessment at the project level. The upper two country level, sector level assessments are not done for every project. They're done for each country once every three or four years. They only update it if there is something to, that have changed. However, the project, execute, project executing agency uh, assessment is done, of course, for, for each project. What does it mean? It means that under a typical project now in the bank, it can be done under the same project, we may use three different procurement systems. For those transactions that are, do not represent a high risk to the bank, they be done by the borrower procurement system in full. Other transactions that are more risky, maybe larger, more complex contracts will be done by the bank's procurement framework. And if we are co-financing with another institution, with our now what we call mutual reliance agreements that we have signed with the EBRD, we're talking with the EIB and the World Bank and so on, we would rely completely on a sister institution to do the procurement as they do. And I think this, when maybe, Hamid, I mean, you raised the issue about executing agencies and the need to <clears throat> review different types of bidding documents and contracts and so on, I think with this mutual reliance agreements, this will go some way in order to uh, to uh, address this. 
Oversight, as we said, borrower procurement systems, we rely only on audits, procurement audits, because we cannot judge uh, based on the government's law. Bank's procurement system, the normal prior post-review of the bank, there is a lot of emphasis on going with post-review to save time. When using third-party systems, again, it's the reports that they are going to, system institutions going to give us. Last thing, my last two slides, how does it really work? Have we started to implement this? This may be too hopeful, too ambitious. Uh, we started this, I gave a project from, from Tunisia where we just signed uh, an agreement for a, a, a water, drinking water supply systems. It's a 97 million euro project, but it's fragmented. It's done in 20 governorates, so they are small contracts here and there. All of them are small in, uh, in value, so we found that in this project, we can start applying the full use of country procurement systems. Um, so all contracts under this project is done by the Tunisia system after we've done an assessment. However, we, rever we reserve the right to revert this decision to use borrower procurement systems if the legal framework that we have assessed have changed in a manner that is not acceptable, only increases the risk of the bank for those transactions that we have uh, decided upon, or the provisions in force are not complied with by the executing agencies or the risk mitigation measures that we have discussed with them are not implemented. Um, as an example of the shortfalls that we have identified in the system and decided to live with them is that, for example, there is no restriction on the participation of public enterprises in public procurement, but in our case, in these contracts, it's not expected that any of these public institutions or public entities are going to participate, so this is a risk that we can accept. Also, they have a provision about contracts concluded between public companies uh, can be awarded for the first four years by direct contracting. We found that none of these public companies are going to be involved in, in this project. However, there are lessons that we have, we are learning as we go. This is still very new. For example, the practices, which we are not really have assessed while we were doing our assessment. We found, for example, that they do consulting services when they open uh, do the opening, they decide to open technical and financial at the same time, which is something that is not acceptable to us. So we decided to say, okay, consulting contracts are not going to be subject to the full use of our procurement system. So it's a system while ongoing in implementation, and whatever we discover, we reserve the right to change really the procurement arrangements that, uh, that, that we do. This was the example of Tunisia, and I hope you found this useful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ashraf. Um, when I, when they asked me what is the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, and they say uh, what is the main difference with the other banks, they always say, oh, yes, it's the bank that does not have the United States as a shareholder. Now, this is getting a little bit tiring, and I would like to ask you instead, if I were to ask you what is, in your opinion, the main difference of the Asian Infrastructure Bank, at least as you see it, one main difference compared to the other MDBs, if there is such a difference. I think it's, it's, it's difficult. I think um, aspiration to be, uh, while being part of the MDB family, the aspiration to be a more efficient and client-oriented bank, which really practices these, these lean values. So that, you know, we have, lean means we, we, we aim to have less bureaucracy. Um, we aim to be a lot more responsive to our clients. And I think you can already see that in the standalone projects which we had. We did our first standalone projects, um, project in June 2016, six months after the bank was formed. There was no PPT or in ADB, we, have, we used to have project preparatory technical assistance. We didn't have any of that. We sent two guys in who knew the sector, who walked around, kicked the tires, and did the proper due diligence and came back and produced a project in six months. We went into Oman um, 
and, and, and part of it is we encourage the governments to come to us with what we call shovel ready projects you know don't don't come to us with a very vague concept so we're trying to be responsive because I think one of the difficulties and someone mentioned this you know we, we forget that you're dealing with political governments you know they've got two three four five year terms and they want to actually see something done so I think it's important that you know our, our interests are aligned with them in a good way for development and therefore we can be we can be responsive so in Oman we went and did two projects within four months um, we've just yesterday approved an India Gujarat roads project which is standalone and we've done that in about eight months so I think we are being quicker we are being responsive and I really hope from where I sit we're not cutting any corners and that, that's, that's going to do something which I'll be keeping an eye on one thing that I liked a lot was the map of Africa I don't know if we can see it again the map of Africa that Ashraf showed where you would see the dispersion or the concentration better of the various kind of projects across Africa which maybe I would ask Ashraf if there is a sense in which that map is not random but has a meaning but I also wanted to ask to you I mean, why so much energy, as you said, in your projects? Why not that kind of dispersion that we see in AFDB's projects? I think the other distinctive part is we are an infrastructure bank. We're not going to do social. We're not going to do agriculture. Uh, we're not going to do finance. Uh, we may do finance to the extent of financing, uh, like, like you know, we've, we've just established a fund in India. We put $150 million of our equity, so it's a private sector operations with Morgan Stanley, where we hope that that fund will raise $1 billion for infrastructure in India. So we will do projects like that. But we, we are an infrastructure bank, and we are, we are not, we're trying very hard not to be everything to everybody. And again, this is a lesson learned by many of us who have been in MDBs. If you look at the MDBs, you know, it's like a Christmas tree. Every time the G20 meets and it figures out there's a new agenda they should focus on, they turn around to the MDBs and say, you know, as, you know usually the European countries will say, well, here's $20 million, $10 million. Can you take this trust fund and can you please, you know, help us address this agenda? I mean, talking to World Bank colleagues, World Bank is not even sure how many trust funds it has and what the value is. It's, it's, it's just so crazy. Well, I don't, I don't think there is a, a, some kind of a pattern to say about, you know, this mass. Because if you look at it, you find that it's... A, it's a mix of different types of projects all across. Um, but really there is nothing, and this changes by the way, this is a, a live map that whenever there's a new project is added, whenever a project is done, is taken out. So this changes all the time as well, yeah. Hello, if I may to ask a question. My name is Remigio Straknis from the European Investment Bank. If I may to ask a question, Mr. Sheriff, uh, concerning uh, your policies at uh, EIB. Uh, well, you mentioned universal eligibility of uh, participants to the procurement procedures. In addition to this issue, it may be interesting, how do you see the issue of local preferences, which may be quite important in certain countries and regions as well. And the second question would relate to uh, the issue of uh, how the bank foresees and approaches the issue of procurement complaints. What mechanism do you foresee at the bank? How you will approach the issue of remedies and complaints in your bank? Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I think on the preferences, we do have provision in, uh, like, like other MDBs, for national preferences. Um, 
So, I mean, um, and, and the justification for that is, is in the promotion of national industries and so on. So I think we're, we'll be allied with the, with the other MDBs. But the question I asked yesterday, I frankly haven't seen any evidence of the effect of these. I mean, and then again, when we were in Asia Peace, uh, we often ask that question, but does anyone really know whether this really matters? I suspect it matters in some countries which have been very smart, and India and China are, are, are two countries which come to my mind. They have something called deemed um, exports. So if you are a local bidder, even under international competitive bidding for a project in India or China, if you're an Indian or a Chinese firm, under their law, because you're bidding for an international contract. So if you win that contract, you're deemed to have exported. And therefore you get a tax, you know, you get an export rebate of 8, 9%. So you have that advantage on day one. So that I've seen work uh, in favor of local, local companies. But then what has happened in, in India, not so much in China, you had a lot of the, say, the ABB India would, would, would be bidding, and they would therefore get benefit of that. So you, you've not entirely excluded the internationals because you know, you've left the door open for them to come and incorporate, but that has added costs. But on the other hand, you know, from a development point of view, if that generates local jobs, it's good. So that's my, my comment. On the, on the complaints mechanism, I think um, we, we, we do entertain complaints. Um, you know, so our, our procurement colleagues can receive those complaints, but you know, we, we, we'll only look at them to a, to a point. It's really encouraging the borrower's systems to deal with that complaint and ensuring that the complaint will be dealt with fairly. And if it isn't, then I think you know, we, we will have issues. And that comes back to the point of you know, how do you define the project? Well, part of the definition of the project is you know, we're going to have fair procurement. It's an integral part of project definition. And if you're not going to abide by that, then you know, we have rights under our loan agreement to stop disbursements, cancel the loan, etc. But we've never done it. Uh, I mean, in, MDBs haven't done that. I don't expect they will, because usually just the threat of that is, is sufficient to get, to get action. Yeah, I wanted to ask to the African Development Bank, what does it mean uh, that you reserve the right to modify, for instance, this envelope thing? How do you put it in practice before publishing the calls, during the contract implementation? Would you, and what would be the consequences of not respecting the procedure? Yes, thank you. What we, what we are saying is that when we do our assessment of the country system, we are assessing the system for a specific transaction under the procurement transaction. And we see whether for this transaction we can use the system or not and whether, what are the risks that is going to be associated with it. Once we've decided that, yes, the risk is acceptable or the risk can be tolerated by the bank and we are going to, so we say to the country, okay, for this project up to this limit, this threshold, all these contracts are going to be done by the country system, for example. Now, if there has been any wrongdoing, this we will only know when we receive the audit reports because we are not going to be looking at each step or prior reviewing the contracts that we are looking at. We'll only get audit reports and then we will see. Then if we realize that Maybe they have not been respecting the uh, applying uh, what they should have applied in accordance to their own law or orders to their system. If there has been any wrongdoings, then we say, okay, maybe for the next project we are going, or maybe even within the same project, we are going to lower these thresholds and we revert back to the use of the country system. And we give the, ourselves this right when we sign the financing, the financing agreement. Or maybe the other way around, maybe they'll do so well that they'll give us more trust in the system. The, the part that maybe I need to stress also, the complementing part, is that when we do a diagnosis of the system, it's not only to identify risk associated for different transactions and so on, but it's also to decide and agree with the country on what we call 
the development action plan, the system development action plan. In this case, we include certain issues that we saw in the system that we feel that they, this is where they need to correct, they need to reform. If they wish to enjoy more uh, projects in their country done completely in accordance with, with their system. So that's how we diagnose, we identify, we start using for small contracts. However, we also at the same time in parallel, we are engaging the country at the country level in order to start a reform of what we saw that is not happening. In the system. Thank you. So my, my question is, um, well, it's not a question actually, it's more of a, a comment that may be useful for you. We worked with KFW, um, the development bank um, based in Germany, and we developed some procurement guidelines for their project managers on sustainability aspects. So those were project managers who dealt with the, the money in the projects and also for project managers who implemented the projects in actually the countries. Um, we focus actually on infrastructure elements. It was quite well received and would be happy to share those guidelines with you to see whether it could be useful because the amounts of money we're talking about and the types of projects um, in the countries that you're focusing on, these could easily be um, how do I put it, pilot projects for sustainability activities or the, a good showcase best practice um, in those countries. It could be a good way in. I would very much welcome that. Thank you. I mean, um, we are called the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and uh, we are not operating only in Europe, and we are not uh, owned only by European companies uh, or countries. Uh, you are the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, not only owned by Asian countries, and question is, where are you going to operate? Which countries? That's a great question. Um, unlike the ADB, we are not confined to Asia. We actually, during the chief negotiators' uh, discussions, uh, this was actually discussed. So if there is a demonstrable benefit to Asia by investing outside of Asia, we will. We're currently considering uh, investments in Egypt, um, and it's conceivable that we will go beyond, uh, particularly if, it's, if it concerns uh, global public goods. So, for example, if it's an environmental project and it contributes to a much cleaner planet, I think Asia benefits. So, we're, we're not closed. May I follow, may I follow on that one? Uh, it turns out that the Silk Road started many centuries ago in a little city called Venice. So now my question to you, would I, coming on, on Jack's point, can I expect that uh, uh, we will see some support for the Venetian Lagoon in the near future from AIAB? Let me share with you uh, a conversation. You know, when I was country director of ADB, my colleagues in Manila said, Hamid, good luck. You're the last country director. You're going to go up, lock the place up, because China is now so rich that we actually shouldn't be. ADB and World Bank should stop lending to China. That's the view of a particularly big shareholder. Right? Um, that has changed. ADB will continue lending to China. And as part of that, I, when I talk to my Chinese counterparts, they gave a very interesting response. They said, look, development is an ongoing process. It never stops. And frankly, we have no problem if uh, tomorrow the U.S. borrows from the World Bank if it needs to for development purposes. And I think that's the philosophy likely to prevail. So we have uh, invested in Oman. And the World Bank perhaps wouldn't because it would say, well, the per capita income is too high, Oman doesn't need our money. Our attitude to say, well, if there is a development case, and in Oman there was, because you know, we need to help the countries in the Middle East diversify away from just oil and gas. So if there is a way for us to engage with that as a de no, for, for development, we could. So conceivably, yes, and Italy is a member. 
other questions from the floor? Well then, uh, it is time to... Oh, absolutely. With great pleasure. I want to come back to actually the very interesting discussion which uh, Christopher's question in the morning uh, triggered and then now um, in, in the session. I want to make really an important point which, which I think is sometimes underestimated. Um, you know, when you talk about human rights or you talk about what is green or you talk about some of the trade issues, these are highly contested concepts, okay? And they only move forward when the membership on the, of the banks has, has a consensus. And I, I'll give you two examples. In our social dimensions, we cover uh, labor rights but we don't cover all core label standards. And there's a reason for that, because not all of our membership has signed on to all of the core label standards. So if you, if you wanted to unilaterally you know, impose those, you couldn't. They would not get through the legislature of the bank, which is the board. So you need to get, get, get consensus there. So, you know, procurement policy, again, just cannot derive that unless you have other policies of these banks which address that. The, the other favorite one is, and we used to discuss this at the, at the HOP several times, where European countries would come, come and say, well, you know, it's really unfair. You allow these Chinese SOEs to compete, and they have massive subsidies, and our private sector can't compete against them. And our view was, that's a trade issue. We're in the business of getting the most efficient uh, economic value, if you like, best value for our clients. So if there's a project in, say, Sri Lanka, and you've got European firms bidding, and you've got Chinese SOEs bidding, we don't really care if the SOEs from China are getting massive subsidies, because that's not a question for procurement. That's a, that's a trade issue. And you want to contest that, you, you raise it as a trade issue. Don't put the monkey on the back of the procurement people. And I think similarly we could go through the meaning of green. Now, some people think green means you never do coal. But if you're Mongolia, you're landlocked, you don't have any gas, right? You've got lots of coal and you're desperately poor. Are you going to say to Mongolia, sorry, we can't finance coal? I mean, you may have to do a coal project. In fact, ADB, I think, is, is financing one. Um, and, you know, so th those, are the hard, those are the realities. Uh, you know, when you look at the many of these concepts which we've been talking about over the, you know, over the last couple of days, they're highly contested and they fall actually outside of procurement. But I think procurement needs to come in. But uh, procurement on its own just can't do it. And we have to be realistic about that. Thank you. I think it's the fate of every conference organizer that the closing argument destroys always a little bit of the wishes of the organizer. I destroyed Paolo Bucci conference by saying that cartels are a great thing to have in procurement because of the Japanese example, and he got completely angry, correctly so. Now I am trying to put procurement everywhere, and correctly so, I mean, it reminds us that maybe we should think about tw that twice. So I think it's a, it's a good way to close. It's a fantastic way to close a conference because in universities, this is what we do. We challenge ourselves and we want to hear different opinions from ours. Um, I, I